before we enter into our time of worship, I just wanted to share something with you all really quick. Um, God is so good. Amen. <laughs> um, and the fact that we get to worship here together in community every Sunday is such a blessing. Like, it is, like, so easy to take for granted. And I always go through the motions every Sunday. of Like, okay, I'm going to church again. But, like, that's such a big thing is that I get to go to church um, with other believers and worship with them. Um, and so I just want to take a second um, and I want all of you to go to a place, um, time in your life, and remember a time where you literally gave um, everything that you had to the Lord in a time of worship. Um, you remember a time where you just gave him everything that you had and all of your praise and surrendered everything to him. And he was just so good that all you could do was just give him all of you. Um, so I want you to go to that moment, and then I want all of us together to bring exactly what we brought in that moment to this moment right now together. Um, and so I'm, as I'm saying that, I'm going to read this scripture. Um, it's First Chronicles 16, starting in verse 23, which says, Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his dwelling place. Verse 29. Ascribe to the Lord and glory do his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in splendor of his holiness. Verse 31. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. If you all would stand with me, and we're going to enter into our time of worship.
we sing, oh. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. And oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified. Transformation. 
praise arise, Christ be magnified in me. And oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. All right. Thank you, Katrina, so much for leading us in worship this morning. Thank you all for joining us here at New Garden this morning. I know that um, it's a nasty day out, but don't worry. I checked the weather. We're not in the way of any tornadoes or anything like that, so you can just let a little bit more peace of mind creep in on you this morning. Um, If this is your first time with us, we're really excited that you're here today. Uh, If you want to connect with us more and do good in the world, you can do that by simply filling out a connection card. These are out at the table in the front when you came in, and they'll still be there afterwards. So it's simple. Name, email address, and you let us know what charity you want us to donate $10 to, and we do that. It's a simple way that we want to we hope that you connecting here helps someone else. And so just a simple act. Um, We'll get you on our newsletter, and it's a really great way to be in the know about what's going on here at New Garden Church. And there's kind of a lot, um, and that's what we're talking about today. If you want to check in on Facebook, that also does good. Um, So just checking in on Facebook is helping build schools in Senegal, so that's cool. Um, So that's just one way that we hope that you being here this morning helps someone else. Uh, And speaking of being here and helping someone else... Isaac wanted to tell us about the Community Cleanup Day that's coming up in May. Yes, um, so on May 20th, we will be out front picking up trash, um, and we're going to invite students and families that go here, um, people from the local community, to help clean up um, the surrounding area. And um, as it says, we're going to pick up trash. Thank you, Isaac. So... um, And that's on May 20th, which is a Saturday. May 21st, we are all going to be hanging out at the park. You're invited. We're having a family park day, a church family park day. So you can show up. We'll be at the Hermitage Park at like 2 o'clock until about 5 o'clock. Kona Ice is going to be there. So it's going to be really fun. It'll be a great opportunity to maybe, uh, you know, pile some some neighbors kids or something into your into your van and come on down it's going to be a fun day um, there at hermitage park Um, so if you think that things that we're doing are things you want to keep up with you can do that easily by texting uh, this number 615-455-2212 and you can text 2023 to that to get updates or you can text support to that if you want to get specific prayer and up and support updates so that's a great way to connect with us um, if you enjoy the things that we do, the things that we're about, uh, we would just invite you to give because we believe that that giving is a way to invest in our community here in, in the Hermitage area. And so that's one thing we really value um, is generosity. Um, just like this week, I'm going to go and I'm going to pick up snacks for uh, TCAP testing here at DuPont Tyler. And that's going to be a great way that we can serve the community here. Um, as, as you might know, TCAP is a standardized test that they take this week and next week. So I know pray for a teacher in your life this week as that's going on. Um, But that's just what we want to do. So if that's something you want to give to, that's the type of stuff that we do. Um, We're really excited that you're here and that Katrina is leading us in worship this morning. Our kids are going to go out this door, our kids and Sprouts. So kids K through six, Sprouts is preschool. Um, It's going to have a really awesome time of praise and worship and then a Bible lesson so it's just a great way for our kids to get connected to a, sto- a Bible story and things like that. Um, Isaac, would you like to pray for us this morning? Dear God, um, we pray that you give everyone here um, a safe um, week ahead of them and a safe rest of their day. Um, we pray that you help everyone struggling in our world right now. Um, we know that you are remaining above, and um, we just pray that you help all of them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Okay, if y'all would stand with me, um, we're going to continue in our time.
more time. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Today, we walk to the mailbox of our Bibles, and we open a letter from James. James who, you say? Uh, veteran Bible readers uh, will not miss the fact that James, the Hebrew form of Jacob, Jacob, James, is a really common name. In fact, you may remember that two of the original 12 that Jesus called had the name James. So which James is it? Could be either of those James, but an early death of one, and the fact that we know very little about the other leads most people to say most of the evidence points to this James being James, the leader of the Jerusalem church, James, the brother of Jesus. Now let that sink in for just a minute. Jesus' brother who sends out this letter. And if that's true, and I, I think it is, there may be a message right out of the gate in the opening sentence. The brother of Jesus introduces himself as the servant of Jesus to the 12 tribes scattered. Greetings. Now, as we work our way through this letter, you will notice along the way that James does not cite the name of Jesus all that much. In fact, outside of the opening greeting, Jesus is mentioned by name as much as Rahab is mentioned by name. And yet, as we work our way through this letter, as we consider the words of James, you won't miss the influence of Jesus. It's stamped on every page. In fact, sometimes I think James could have simply put shorthand, see the Sermon on the Mount. If you read James, and I think it's a good thing to do, uh, in one hand and the Sermon on the Mount in the other hand, there will be places where you may get tripped up and forget which one you are reading. Places like James 5. Above all, brothers and sisters, do not swear either by heaven or earth or by any other oath. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. And we say yes. But again, veteran Bible readers will say, I've heard that before. Oh yes, Matthew 5. In fact, if James were writing a modern term paper, he would have been indicted for plagiarism. Hear this, but I say to you, do not swear at all either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Let your word be, it's almost identical, isn't it? Yes, yes. Or no, no, anything more than this comes from the evil one. So James, the brother of Jesus, clearly influenced by the teaching of Jesus, and there's more that we could say about the 12 tribes scattered and trying to reconstruct what might have been happening there, but I'm compelled this morning to do less there and a little bit more here about the place we receive this letter today. Uh, first up, I'm going to lean into the advice of a, a, a teacher. Scott McKnight said, if you're teaching the book of James, if you're working on James with a group, if you're preaching James, if you go to the classroom and you begin a study of the James, you go to the board and you write these two words, you begin here, read James. <laughs> read James. It sounds simple, I know, but we can find all kinds of creative ways to start in other places, but I want to commend to you today, read James. As we work our way through the series, if you're a listener, just hit play. You can hear. Did you know that you can listen to the letter of James in less than 15 minutes? Some of you are going to want to do that over and over. Some of you may feel like that's overload. James is all over the place and maybe in small doses. 
But I want to invite you to begin with me and read James. Uh, if you're a listener, hear James. But I need to, to warn us at the outset, as you hear James, get ready. James doesn't hold any punches. This is wisdom, but it's not just any wisdom. So as you hear it, hang in there, because most of us have a filter that may make this letter challenging. It's the same filter we employ when we encounter anything new. The filter, does it make sense? Does it make sense? I've learned in, in parenting, in life, all times, I'll, I'll look at my kids and they'll do something and I'll look in the eye and say, did that make sense to you? I, I've learned in parenting and in life that we don't all have the same sense, do we? Just because something makes sense to you doesn't mean it necessarily makes sense to me. Maybe you've heard the common antidote about common sense. Common sense is like deodorant. The people who need it the most don't use it, <laughs> right? We don't all have the same sense, but I do think we all have some version of the same filter. When we encounter something new, something different, something that feels foreign, a new commentary on life, we ask ourselves internally, if not audibly, does it make sense? And I'm bringing it up now here at the outset of the letter because we may need to adjust that filter. Override the governor. A at least some of this, not initially, it it's not going to make sense. It's counterintuitive. It cuts against the grain. It swims upstream. It works in a way that our world seldom operates. It is a different worldview. It is wisdom. But this is the wisdom of Jesus. You, you see it in that second verse, don't you? When you encounter trials, count it joy. What? Count it joy? I know, I know, in context and with explanation, it makes all kinds of sense. But can we all just acknowledge this morning, at first blush, that does not make sense. When you encounter trials, consider yourself unfortunate. When you encounter all kinds of trials, consider yourself tried. When you encounter trials, consider yourself pitied. That makes sense. But this, you know, it makes sense. In our world, it makes sense to keep score with dollars and cents. Not, verse 9, believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride. No, no, it makes sense. Keep score with dollars and cents. But James says, verse 9, if you have a little, boast in that little. And if you have a lot, be careful. That doesn't make sense, we say. You ever watch a basketball go up off the rim and then go down through the hoop? The way it hit the rim, you think it never should have went in. And you hear somebody say, you... You must be living right. For that ball to go that way, a crazy bounce in a game of ping pong, a round of unbelievable luck in life, we say, you must be living right. Because we assume that right living translates into nice living. The better you do, the more you have. It makes sense. But James says, believers in humble circumstances boast. I I'm going to tell you, read James, but at first blush, a lot of James may not make sense. It may feel foreign, novel, novel unfamiliar, even at times threatening. A long time ago, many years ago, uh, American novelist Upton Sinclair read James chapter 5, 1 to 5. 
He read it in front of a group of ministers. James 5, 1 to 5, but in a sly way, he did not cite James 5, 1 to 5 as being from James. Instead, he attributed the words to Russian anarchist Emma Goldman, just to see what might happen. James 5, 1 to 5, attribute it somewhere else, and immediately ministers called for Sinclair's to get him out of here, they said. And we may, may be able to defend the action with the association. Well, you saw who he quoted. But I wonder, how is it that a group of Christians, ministers nonetheless, didn't recognize the words as belonging to the book of James. I wonder, would we do any better? Read James. Read it. But don't stop there. I want to invite you, as we begin this study together, to read it, to pray it, and to try it. If we just hear James, we won't honor it. James says as much in the very first chapter. If I am a hearer of God's word, but never a doer, then I am not a disciple, according to James or Jesus. Uh, as another writer said, our faith said, must come into alignment with our life led. There's a lot to try on. There are 42 imperatives in this little letter of James. Read it. But in between the reading and the trying, I want to commend praying. How do you pray a letter? I don't know. Let's figure that out. It, it may be as simple as, um, Lord, I'm going to need some help with this part. Jesus, I'm a little confused about. It, it could mean, thank you, Jesus, for, and then just begin the letter. Read it. End it. In Jesus' name, amen. I wonder if we might hear something differently if we prayed the letter. Lord, would you give me a place, a place that I see today to put this into practice? Holy Spirit, would you help me? Read it. Pray it. I say pray it because if we read the Bible simply to know the Bible, then we miss the point of the Bible. The point of the Bible is not just that we would know the Bible, but that we would know the God of the Bible. To connect with the one who made us. Read it. Pray it. Whether you were baptized last week or you've been reading this letter for 60 years, I think we could all do with some reading and some praying, yes? I say pray it because I think it may be the, the part that we let go of the quickest with familiarity. Read it. Oh, I've read it before. I've actually read it many times. Did you know I taught a Sunday school class one time? Fantastic. Read it. Let's read it together. Pray it. I, I think in between the reading and the trying is the glue of the praying because we're going to need some help with some of this. Again, full disclosure, some of this at first touch will feel like it fits like a sweater in the middle of summer. Consider it pure joy. Really? Joy? All joy. Trials? Joy? What's that? The artificial happy face we stamp onto our face before we walk into the church doors? Surely it's more. What is it? Read it. Pray it. Try it. Maybe. Maybe it's like muscle only formed when it's broken down and stretched. So it is with, with faith struggle. Read it. Pray it. Try it. Rinse and repeat cycle. Read it. Pray it. Try it. And it may help us even in this second sentence of James. Consider. Consider it pure joy. All joy. Consider. Uh, it's a different lens, isn't it? To, to look not just at the trial, but through the trial. James says, don't just look at it, look through it to what it will produce. Consider it joy. And here I believe James stands with a great cloud of witnesses. Consider, consider it joy. Paul considered, he considered his trial standing before the king. You remember King Agrippa? Paul considered that trial with his life on the line an occasion to proclaim good news. 
Paul considered his former glory, his earlier status. He said, I consider it a loss. Abraham considered God able. Moses considered the suffering, suffering with the Lord to be better than treasures in Egypt. Early Christian martyrs, people like Perpetua and Felicitas, they considered it an honor to stand and suffer and even give their life in the name of Jesus. Consider. Will you consider with me this morning that there may be more to life than amassing stuff? That there is something better than avoiding adversity. Consider. You know, Jesus did not consider equality with God as something to exploit. Consider the fact that Jesus died while we were still sinners. Consider just for a minute this morning that there may be more, more to life than what you are choking on and anxious about. Consider it. Jesus said, consider, consider the birds of the air and the flowers in the field. Consider how they are cared for. And don't you know, God cares more for you. Romans 8 and 18, I consider that the suffering of this present time is not worthy of comparison with the glory that is to be revealed. Uh, earlier this year, I went uh, back to Jackson and I went to help lay to rest a, a great friend and shepherd, Scott Owens. Um, he developed way too early in life a, a nasty form of brain cancer. Uh, and though he enjoyed some good time and they threw everything they had at the treatment, in the end, the, the treatment wasn't enough. And in the end, it was, it was hard. It was really hard in ways that I know that many of you are familiar with. You've, you've walked with the loved one. Uh, his... His wife told me, and not just me, but others, uh, there in the end, when things were bad, when they were really, really bad, she would read this text over and over again. Consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing. They're not worthy of comparison to the glory that is to be revealed. She said she'd read it over and over again, even at times when she wasn't sure if he was hearing it. Consider. She said, we, we believe that. And that's a lot, because this is a lot. Consider the sufferings of this present time. Consider, consider, consider James, and not just what he knew, but who he knew. Uh, more than 20 years ago, there was a pharmaceutical company, uh, M. Clone Systems, a pharmaceutical company that works on uh, cancer-related treatment, maybe among other things, but at least that. Um, and most signs pointed to things going up, and it was easy to be excited. There had been a lot of growth. There was a new drug uh, that looked like it was about to be approved by the FDA. It was hard not to be excited. All things look up. It's why it was really hard to explain the actions of some executives and family members and people as notable as, you remember Martha Stewart? They dumped a bunch of stock, and the actions just didn't make sense. What did they know that we don't know? And then come to find out they did know, at least a few days before everyone else, this drug that everybody was excited about, it didn't get the FDA approval. They knew something, not everybody else did. Now, what they did was, uh, it was immoral and illegal, but they knew something not everybody else knew. I, I'm going to tell you James knows something, but it's not a secret. It's not a trade secret. It's not relegated to the elite. But he knows something that some of us don't choose to know. James realizes what Jesus teaches. He knows what we easily overlook, that if we lap up the whole world and we lose our souls, what do we have? James knows. Is there anything better than the kingdom of God? And so as you work your way through this letter, read it, pray it, try it, read it, pray it, try it. Consider not just what James knows, but whom. Consider him. The Hebrew writer said, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners like us. So you won't grow weary and lose heart. Consider him. And as you begin your journey, as we begin it together, read it, pray it, try it, 
I want to invite you to consider the words of James. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of God stands forever. Uh, Lord, would you help us? Help us to live in light of the truth you teach us. Help us to live in a way that that won't make sense to all of our neighbors, won't make sense even to us at times, but makes truth, makes good on the truth that you, that you reveal to us in Jesus Christ. Lord, help us. Help us as we seek to work on this together, to live lives that are worthy of the calling we received. Lord, I pray today for those who limped into this space, and honestly, it was hard just to get here. <laughs> and and those, those words, even at the beginning of this letter, they're hard. Consider it joy. It's so easy for us to consider everything else that we carried into this time. Lord, I pray for those who are in the middle of it right now. I pray that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would help us see more than we are inclined to see by ourselves. Help us see not just the trial, but to see through it, to see what it can produce in us. Lord, help us to see others, to see ourselves, but more than anything, help us, Lord, see you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. As we get ready to go to the table this morning, um, what we do every week is we go to the table, we eat bread, and we drink grape juice. It symbolizes Jesus' body and blood. We do that every single week. Um, and as we come to the table this morning, uh, in light of what we've just heard in the book of James, um, I think about Jesus. I think about Jesus in the garden, knowing that he was going to the cross, and he considered the goodness that God would bring through his life and death and new life, he went through with it. He didn't have to, and he went through with it. And so this morning, as we go to the table, let us consider what Jesus has done for us and what that means for us how that affects our lives. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you this morning thankful that you have provided a way for us. You've provided a new life for us, God, that we didn't earn or deserve. Um, and though we face many things in our life that are frustrating and hard and just life-taking, God, we know that because of you, we have life. God, because of you, we don't have to face the hard things in life alone. God, we know that you use things. You don't cause them, but you work through them to grow us and sustain us and pull us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go to the table. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Your very spoken to me and I I'm desperate for you and I I'm lost without you
This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my Thank you, everybody, for being here this morning. Consider it pure joy as you go about your week. Through the many different experiences, remember that God is with you. Go in grace and peace to love and serve the Lord. Bye.